Uh, I'll take a few minutes up front to introduce Jakob, who I'm uh, very happy to, to welcome today at Casus. Uh, Jakob is a staff member in the scientific software group at CERN in Geneva. Uh, he received a PhD in computer science from the Technical University in Munich in 2012. Afterwards, he was a Marie Curie fellow um, at CERN, and he was also a visiting scholar at the RAM Cloud Research Group at Stanford University. Jakob works on distributed systems and storage software. And at CERN, he created the CERN VM file system, which he evolves ever since. And he currently works uh, in the root team where he leads the R&D project on a new columnar data format for high energy physics. Jakob, I'm happy to welcome you here. here. For the kind introduction and for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to talk a little bit about uh, computing in high energy physics. And then uh, I will narrow it down to um, how we do data analysis, um, what we do in the root team about it, and specifically about IO, which is my, my, uh, my topic. Uh, can you hear me all right? Is the voice, is the you know, volume okay? Good. All right. So that slide uh, was conveniently uh, made obsolete by, by, by your <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, so let's move to the agenda and let's go straight to computing in high energy physics. So my uh, place of work is CERN. Uh, it's in Geneva and it's actually not unlike this institute here. It's a border region. You see, uh, you see the border between Switzerland and France. The CERN site on the left end is just on the border. And one of the tools that we operate, oh, that's great, thank you. Maybe you can point. Or you can directly use the point. Oh, yeah, I can actually use my mouse. Ah, oh, yeah, it's perfect. So the CERN site is here. And one of the tools that we operate is the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. You see the schematics of the LHC here. Uh, so it's a 27 kilometer ring collider. It's underground, between 50 and 150 meters underground, depending on the terrain. You see, just uh, as a, you know, to compare the size, this is the airport of Geneva here. In the background, you have the Jura Mountains. And uh, so what, what we can do with the scientific tool is we can collide particles at very high energies, which gives us access to uh, physics of the smallest scales. And uh, so the, we want to do this at high energies. Uh, one of the reasons is that with high energies, we can produce heavier particles, which we may not have seen so far. And uh, there are some key parameters that restrict how far you can go with the energy. One of them is the, uh, is the strength of the magnets and uh, then also the size of the ring. So bigger ring in principle can, can get you to higher energy. So that's one, one reason why you know, a big ring is, is, is beneficial. And you don't, but you don't only have the, the accelerator, of course you have experiments that measure what happens when you collide particles. We have four large LHC experiments. There's Alice, Atlas, the mouse is a bit sluggish, um, CMS and LHCD. These are big particle detectors. And if you look into one of these particle detectors, this is what you can see. This is the Alice detector. You have in red, a large magnet around the detector itself. That's a common um, setup. We will later see why this is a good idea. Um, you see, just again, you know, if you, if you want to have a comparison for the scale, you see technicians working here. Right? You have a technician over here, you have a technician here. So you, you can try to spot all the technicians in this picture. So you see it's a large construction. Uh, it's actually a construction that takes place in many places around the world. So these detectors, they are built at research institutions and uh, universities around the world and then brought to CERN and assembled. Uh, so there's a fair deal of engineering involved. Uh, and also at a later point in the computer science. Um, and despite their size, they have to be actually very precisely manufactured, very precisely aligned. You have to understand them very well to understand in the end the physics that you measure. So that is how the hardware looks. If you look at it from a perspective of the software, uh, this is what you, uh, you know, what we call an event. Oh, there's actually a better mouse. Maybe, maybe I take this one. Yeah, but it's, you're not seeing it. 
There's a problem. Oh, okay, okay. Stop. Stop. I see. <laughs> All right. So, so this is then how, how the detector looks in software. And what you see here is what we call in high energy physics, what we call the event. So the event is, a, is like the central, uh, let's say, well, data structure. So it's what the detector collected as a result of a bunch crossing. And you have two beams, you have a bunch crossing, and then particles collide. And usually it's not just one, it's, it's a few. At the moment, we have typically like 40 particles at the same time that collide. And of course, I mean, if you see a picture like this, some processing took place already, right? Because what is measured are some detector signals. So you have to try to uh, and, and reconstruct the physics that took place. You see there has been some tracking. So you, you, you connect the dots and, uh, and find, uh, find the tracks, some classification, you know, what kind of particles did you see? So this is all the, then the software processing. And what is nice about our problem, well, there's obviously a lot of data, but all the events are independent from each other. That is great. We have this inherent data parallelism. So we can bundle up like a thousand events, send them to computer A, another thousand events, send them to computer B, and they can operate uh, independently from each other. Um, that's almost the entire story. Of course, at some point you need to merge results or data. And uh, so it's, it's not, let's say, purely, uh, trivially parallel. But it's, it's, it's like inherently parallel enough that we typically um, do not need the, the very fast interconnects that you find in, uh, in, in, in HPC installations. And that led to this... Uh, yeah, split. I think Myron Livni was the first who introduced this term high throughput computing as compared to high performance computing. So the, the key metric really is the throughput of events. Uh, probably throughput is also important in high performance computing, but we do not need the, the fast interconnects necessarily. And then what people realize is, okay, since this is so, so nice and uh, you know, parallelizable, maybe we don't have to have all the computing resources at CERN. Uh, and this is exactly what happens. Uh, what, what happened, uh, the distributed computing system that we built, we built it like analog to, to the way we built the detector. So all the research institutes and universities that are involved in building a de particle detector, they also contribute a part of the data center to the computing. So what the, as a result, there's a federated computing. Uh, it's... Uh, um, federated uh, really in all various aspects, like technologically from the policy point of view and so on. And uh, this was called the grid. And, uh, you know, a very like oversimplified uh, way, you know, think of it as a global batch system where you try to match, you know, to find where's this piece of the data that I'm interested in now, which has been pre-placed at various sites, where is it? And then you move the code relatively close to the data. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're interested like in the, in the uh, uh, academic background, I think the, the first seminal paper was the anatomy of the grid. And then there's a whole uh, uh, research trail based on that. So the grid today is what you see here is 170 sites around uh, of all shapes and sizes. So for instance, CERN shares 20%, that's a big one, but you have also very uh, many smaller ones. Uh, 40 countries, uh, an exabyte of data, and uh, well, many jobs every day. And that is what we, what we have at our disposal for today's, HLNH, for today's LHC computing problem. Um, actually, we have a little bit more at our disposal because um, we have now uh, did more types of resources that we get uh, that, that, that sort of extend the traditional grid. Right? Things like the data centers that are directly at the, at the uh, experiments, but then also opportunistic resources of various kinds. For instance, backfill uh, cycles on HPC systems or the cloud. Um, if, if someone gets a good deal for a grant for a certain time on the cloud and so on. So it's, it's heterogeneous. And it's good, we can always use more resources because there are plans for the future. Um, so you see the, like the project plan, if you will, of, of the LHC. There are usually multi-year 
uh, long runs where you collect data and then you have a few you know one or two years uh, technical stop where you upgrade the accelerator and the experiments and we are at the moment here at the end of long shutdown two uh, towards run three and after run three there will be a very large upgrade to or with yeah after run three with long shutdown three and run four to the hllhc so the high luminosity lhc so what does it mean you see in red how key parameters increase uh, this is the energy and the luminosity so higher energy is nice uh, among other things because we can produce heavier particles uh, but this has more or less maxed out, right? We have been at 13 TeV, we go now to 14 TeV, but that's about it. What, what, what we can do with this technology of the magnets with this ring. What we can do otherwise is increase the luminosity. So how many uh, collisions, um, how, yeah, how many collisions we can connect. And that can help us to find new physics in like small deviations from the standard one, right? Here is really a statistics game. And um, you see that, uh, well, the luminosity, and if you see, the, this is an interesting number, the integrated luminosity at the end of round three is at this 350 uh, inverse femtobahn. And uh, this should go up to three, 4,000 inverse femtobahn. So factor of 10 more. Uh, other experimental conditions change as well. For instance, for the hardware people, um, it's an interest, it's interesting challenge to build detectors that can uh, with that withstand the, the radiation um, environment, uh, especially close to the collision points. Uh, and for us on the software side, what is interesting is that we have higher pileup. Right? So we go from 40 uh, collisions per event to something like 140, 200 collisions per event. So it's like, you know, if you have a digital camera and, or if you have a camera and you have, you know, you have, you're in a condition with full of light, it's then easy to see nothing anymore. It's just, uh, right. So, and, and the algorithms, many of the algorithms that you use to disentangle the bits and pieces in the collisions, they don't scale linearly. They, they scale maybe quadratically or, you know, so, so this is an interesting challenge. The, so we don't, not only have more events, but every, each and every event is also more complex to process. Okay, so this is uh, the large, uh, like overview picture of, of, the, of the data stream. You get data, of course, from the detector, that's one way, or from the simulation, that's, that's the other source of data. Uh, then you, you filter data, not, not every collision is an interesting one, actually there are like five, six orders of magnitude that you filter away, store the raw data, then there's a reconstruction step where you try to identify what has been the physics and what is the uncertainty uh, of uh, what you think is the physics. And these are relatively uh, central processes of computing. And then you have analysis groups distributed all over the world who take analysis objects, so data sets that are already like pre-processed to do analysis. Um, and uh, at the end, the very end, of course, you get publications. So you have a, you have a uh, huge data compression, if you will, from the from the petabytes of input data to papers and plots at the end. Right. So this is, by the way, I, I will I will come to more uh, advanced schemes. I mean, this is like the classical data flow that you uh, have directly at the detectors. You have electronics and filter farms that uh, throw away events, and then you would store the raw data, reconstruct them transform them to analysis formats and, and uh, those uh, analysis typically make it into histograms. So with HLNHC, we will move a little bit more towards real-time processing. Um, because you, you might not, um, uh, so you might not be able actually anymore to, to uh, find all the interesting events in this very simple filter steps. But in fact, what you can do instead is you, you say, okay, let's do a full reconstruction of everything that we see. And uh, you don't filter in this way, but you sort of compress. So you, you, you get the useful information out of the, out of the detector signals in real time uh, 
Uh, and uh, well, that has been made possible in parts by the GPU programming uh, that we can do nowadays, for instance, for tracking. And this is an example from the LHCB example uh, from the LHCB detector. What they will do as of run three, you have five terabytes per second of data that go directly into a four to five terabytes per second that go into the GPU filter farm. So I don't know, maybe a thousand nodes or so with GPUs that do the tracking, uh, do almost a full reconstruction, and only so. And then you have really a, a good base of knowledge. Uh, where you can uh, where you can then do further filtering and analysis. So that is an interesting uh, interesting challenge. Uh, of course, from the performance point of view, to to write the software that is fast enough, but also from the physics point of view, because uh, that's all great, but you have only one shot. Right? If you don't collect the raw data, but you reconstruct and store the reconstructed result, if you get it wrong, the data is lost. How, how many tracks are there? Uh, so for LHCB, I, I can't tell. Um, that's a good question. How many tracks? Well, I mean, you have, have a pileup of, of uh, 200, let's say, one of the other experiments. Um, but you have like lead, lead, and some... Uh, yeah, then of course, it, it, uh, so for the lead, lead, it's even more interesting, uh, at least if you look at, at Alice, because then you don't even have the pictures anymore. Yeah. But the, there's a continuous readout of the yeah. of, of the TPC, um, thousands, tens of thousands. I think that's the order of magnitude. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that you need that many GPUs. It's the uh, it's a time budget that is. It's, so it's not the individual event that is critical, but you get so many events. Yeah, but five terabyte can be handled by fifty GPUs easily. Easily, so it's a, today. I think the order of magnitude. Okay, maybe it's a few hundred nodes oh, of yeah, GPUs. Yeah, maybe yeah. something like that. Um, there might be some additional tasks that are done, not only tracking. Perhaps oh. there's also a bit of clustering. Oh. Okay, yeah, because usually the, the 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 limiting factor, if you do not do lots of computations, is just the. Is just the connection to the GPU, so the the, the basic uh, input mm -hmm. stream you can have uh, the, the PCI Express, rather than than what you do on the GPU. You have to be quite substantial in online analysis in terms of calculating before you really see any mm -hmm. uh, effect. You can do quite a lot on a GPU when when it, the input speed is really the limiting task. I was a bit surprised when you said a thousand. I would I would have guessed at least one order of magnitude smaller, if, because five terabytes is not that much. It, it sounds a lot, but it's actually not that much anymore. <laughs> it was it was frightening five years ago, but now now it's it's a much, which is good. Which yeah, is not a bad thing. Be, <laughs> so this is ballpark. I mean, yeah. it's very well possible that it's uh, I don't yeah. know only two hundred. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which is still quite nice. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, so a little bit into the individual um, computing tasks, what you do. So I spoke about simulation, the, and what does it mean? Well, what you simulate is uh, what happens in a collision. So we call this event generators. You, uh, you, you uh, calculate like the collision results. Uh, and then what is, uh, uh, what is uh, like a difficult task to do, but all of them are difficult, but particularly difficult and particularly dif difficult to parallelize is the particle transport. So that means what happens when the particle traverses a detector material, uh, a, a magnetic field, so what happens in the detector. And uh, this, I mean, the, the, the problem seems to be that um, it's not, it's not clear that this is a SIMD uh, type of calculation. So where you have the same instruction on multiple data, you usually have different instructions on different data. If you look at the code, a lot of the code is really like if this, if that, and especially if you go into hadronic physics, uh, then, then it, it becomes uh, quite challenging to make this efficiently, an efficient match for GPU pipelines. So this is one of the research areas uh, that, are, that are being addressed at the moment. 
Another idea to, to do to make fast simulation is with uh, machine learning techniques, general generative uh, techniques, uh, where you uh, yeah generate how you know, this input this input particle uh, would would look like in the detector. And there are some successes here. Attila, are you in? Okay, let's see. Just checking. No, Attila, then I have to speak for him later. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there has been some successes with GANs and with variational autoencoders. And uh, one of the challenges is to get tail distributions right. So you often get like the, I don't know, mean energy deposition or so. That is something that you can generate uh, more easily than the tails of the distribution. Then you have the, the uh, task of reconstruction. And now you see why, why these uh, detectors come with very strong magnets. They come, come with strong magnets because then the charged particles that are generated they make a curve. Uh, they make a, a curve trajectory, and by measuring the the curve, you you can uh, you can reconstruct the momentum of the particle and the charge. And you see that you have like different types of detectors for different particles. You have these so-called tracking detectors. So you get all these little dots here in the layers, and then you have to connect them to a continuous track. You have a calorimeters where you measure the energy of the incoming particle and uh, the, the light of the cells that, that light up. This is uh, proportional to the energy of the particle that gets in. So here you have the clustering algorithms that are relevant. And it's a, it's a little bit of a puzzle game, right? You see all these different uh, detector signals and you try to put them together to a coherent picture, of course, with uncertainties. Uh, there's, by the way, a very nice uh, overview of the like algorithmic background of reconstruction uh, from uh, Frühwirt and, uh, and colleagues. I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned before uh, tracking and now reconstruction. And yes. to me, it seems both involve finding the, the trace of the particle through the detector. So what's the difference? So tracking is one part of the reconstruction. Okay, so it's a substage. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then at some point you come to the data analysis step, and uh, so you you have like the sort of head data interpretation model. So what you are interested in oftentimes is uh, what is the probability of seeing this and that data given this and that model. So you have a simulation with certain assumptions, and then you compare that to to what you have measured in the data, and right? where the, the simulation uh, goes from the from the event generators to the uh, simulated detector signals, and then the the real data sort of goes the opposite way. You have the you have the detector signals, and you reconstruct uh, what has probably happened in reality. And like one very concrete example, of what you could do is you could try to figure out invariant mass, right? So let's say you you are looking at this decay channel. You try to measure the mass of a B meson. And uh, what you have found in your detector, because that particle is not very stable, you measured three kaons. And uh, now you can think, hmm, how do we get the mass of the, of the B meson? Well, I have measured the uh, momentum of the kaons. I know their mass. So by, uh, by combining this, uh, I can uh, figure out, by combining the, the momentum, I can figure out the momentum of the, of the B meson. And I um, need to... Uh, the, um, you know, by momentum and energy, you get the mass of the of the, of the B meson, right? So you combine these the, the things you do to combine these known properties from the things you have measured uh, back to to uh, to, um, uh, to to the um, to, to the observable you're interested in, and you might get such a nice uh, peak here that tells you, okay, here. Um, is, is the mass peak of the, of the B meson. Um, so that is, you know, that is very nice. This is something that you can do, I don't know, in, in an afternoon or so, but that's not the whole story. This is like the, the final step, right? Of course, you have uncertainties, you have background, you have this and that. So this is the very last step of a, of a heavy PhD thesis. 
But what's interesting for computing, what you can see, so here are my measurements, right? So here's what I have measured, the momenta of the, of the kaons. And we see, okay, we have put this in a table, and we have k on 1, px, py, bz, k on 2, and so on. And well, the table is maybe not the data structure that is best suited because, okay, this time I look at three kaons, but maybe, you know, my next event has two kaons and then one after that has five. So what do I do? Well, it turns out that uh, our natural data structure is actually, uh, you know, has nested subcollections. It's sort of tabular, but every cell in the table is a little subtable, right? You have, you have the particles, uh, they have a charge perhaps in the momentum, and they are connected to a collection of tracks and so on. Um, I, I will come back to this point uh, in a minute. Just a little bit about scale, how this typically works. So uh, researchers typically start working on an analysis on their personal resource on, on the laptops with a small sample data set, one terabyte to 10 terabyte. Uh, and, that is, uh, and, and then you do some, some, you know, you develop first ideas. Then you, you need to test this in a larger data set on more statistics. So typically you have a step like analysis cluster for, for a research group. That might be something like 50 to 200 terabytes. And what you want to have is a turnaround time of half an hour, something like this. Uh, and then you, uh, the, the last step is actually an interesting one because there have been some ideas where with an analysis facility, you actually stop looking at individual analysis programs and say, okay, this program needs this data, so I schedule it here and run it there. But what you say is, okay, if I take the union of all the analysis that run in the experiment uh, at a given point in time, well, it turns out I need almost all the data, the, you know, in, in, in total. So I, I could sort of reverse the problem and say, okay, I push all my data through the analysis facility and my algorithms can hop on, uh, can hop on the train. So you have like a very fast train that, that runs through and, uh, and, and, this, and all the algorithms that are ready at this given point uh, in time, uh, they, get, they get to see the data. That is, an, I find an interesting idea that is especially driven at the moment by the Alice experiment. Not surprisingly. <laughs> why, why, why is it not surprising? Uh, be, because I think uh, Alice is special in its data needs and also in the complexity of what they are doing. Due to the, the heavy ion collisions, exactly. yes, that is true. Yeah. And, and they have been thinking a lot about high throughput computing. I mean, we, we talk a lot about the GSI people mm -hmm. and the Alice Root people, uh, uh, Mohammed and, and yeah. the others are basically very strong partners in, in Helmholtz. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think this is a, a, a similar good or bad idea than the other. <laughs> You certainly know what's coming in terms of data, and data is, data throughput is currently the limiting factor. Yeah. It's not com computational complexity, really. Right, and the advantage here is that in, in this model, you can, uh, I mean, you have all your data at one place. Uh, you don't have to deal with the remote data access, with the scheduling copies, and you know, managing the number of copies in your distributed system, things like that. Yeah. Right, so all of this sounds uh, uh, suspiciously, uh, you know, similar to big data, uh, you know, ecosystem, but there are some differences. Uh, you know, in typical in your typical big data infrastructure, you have uh, a dedicated uh, facility, you have, uh, like one one cloud, uh, you know, one one set of infrastructure built. You uh, have a you use like a distributed, um, uh, sorry, a, you know, like a a workflow engine that, that distributes your computation according to dependencies, and your data is often like textual, uh, textually based. Um, so if you look at our problem, uh, we have the federated infrastructure still by and large. Uh, so so that is that is quite different. What does dark mean? Uh, sorry, directed acyclic graph. Uh, so 
yeah, uh, representing the dependencies between the different computing tasks. Mm -hmm. We don't have a very complex distributed workflow. I mean, we, we do have these data dependencies uh, uh, expressed, but this is typically on a single node. Like you can do this reconstruction step after that reconstruction step, things like that. But it, it's happening like in one in one machine. Uh, we have what is a big difference is uh, a different, usually a different, yeah, data structure to start with these nested collections. And then on the like on the statistic sides, there are some specialities. Histograms are very important to energy physics, so I think there's probably the most advanced uh, pro, you know, API support, tool support for for histograms you find in energy physics. So it's not just a visualization option, but you can actually calculate. You know, you can treat them as objects. You can sum them up, divide them by each other, things like that. And uh, ansatz fitting is still uh, very important. So it's not all machine learning, but uh, oftentimes you have a model with certain unknown parameters, and, and then you try to fit uh, these complex models. OK, so for all of this, you need software. One of the key pieces of the software is root, is a data analysis uh, framework, things you can do with it, with it. Of course, you can create nice plots. For instance, the one on the left, it's the one on helping you distinguish different particle types from each other by their energy loss over a certain distance. Uh, or you can make like the plot on the right. And uh, that one also shows a little bit like this, um, the, the, the length, the, the, the process of finding new things is a lengthy process. You see <laughs> how long you collect data here. The, uh, the Atlas experiment collected data here over several months. And they were looking at a Higgs to two photon channel. So they were looking for two photons. Um, and uh, of course, you have a background. Uh, we have many reasons why you could see two photons from the same uh, process. And um, but then you see also little excess. So at the very end of the picture, you see like you know, there's little excess at 126 GeV, and that means you found something. So there must be something that is not understood by the theory. Um, all other measurements uh, then made it clear that this something is very compatible with the Higgs boson. But at this point, it was only clear that we saw something. Okay, so root uh, from a computer science perspective, from a software perspective, is an open source software framework, has uh, building blocks, um, there's uh, uh, um, data serialization and storage part, uh, something that helps you with. Uh, or data processing, uh, there's a Jupyter notebook integration, a little bit of parallelism. Um, then you have uh, you know, math tools, machine learning, you know, visualization, um, and so on. It's a C++ toolkit with strong Python bindings. I'll speak about this in a minute. And uh, it's mainly used in high energy physics with some applications outside. It has quite a bit of data stored. Uh, uh, the exabyte of LHC data. Um, and so let's dive a little bit into its internals. I think one of its most interesting features is a C++ interpreter called Kling, based on LLVM's Clang. And um, so this enables many of Root's advanced features. Once you have an interpreter, well, you can, of course, interpret stuff. So you can also, you can also do jitting. Um, and you can build a REPL on top. So if C++ is your preferred language, uh, you can have like an interactive prompt. You can have macros, so you spare the compile time uh, when you develop your algorithms. Um, and it helps you with the Python bindings, right? So through Kling, because you can sort of see and reflect about your C++ side, you don't need to have a swig or you know some static Python bindings that you define up front. But in the running process program, you can call Python from C++ and C++ from Python. And it's very important for the IO because C++ as a language has at least not yet uh, introspection, right? has not uh, a reflection. Uh, but with Kling, we can do this. We can look into the objects and uh, it can tell us what are the data types inside. Another interesting uh, piece of software that you can develop on top of Kling is automatic differentiation. There's a link to CLAD if you're interested in this topic. 
Uh, it's a nice tool. Yeah, uh, parallelism is of course an important topic, uh, so we can try to get our own uh, act together and uh, make root as parallel uh, friendly as possible. But it, it gets, of course, it gets interesting, and we try to help users, researchers, to write parallel code. How do we do this? Um, well, an important tool of this is R Data Frame. The next one, so this is probably known also to people who use pandas data frames. So this, this uh, paradigm is actually quite useful uh, that you move away from the handwritten event loop, uh, from the handwritten code, but you express at a little bit higher abstract level, what is it that you want to do? What is my filter? What is my, what are my derived quantities and so on? And then with, if you have it in this form, in this data frame form, then of course there are lots of, um, uh, lots of interesting, optimizations that you can do uh, um, that, that you can do um, behind the scenes like caching parallelization and so on um, so there was a question in the chat window if, if the reflection is dynamic or static uh, I think there was more to it or was this the the full question I'm oh, sorry Yeah, so the, the, the um... so the question is, is yes. the reflection dynamic, uh, dynamic or static? If I remember correctly, C plus plus twenty three reflection will be static. So if Klingons is dynamic, it will still be more powerful, probably. Um, if you use Kling as an interpreter, it's dynamic. Uh, but uh, for most uh, purposes, it's you, you have a you have a step where you generate a dictionary. So um, this would be static, and you 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 yeah you you make it part of your compilation process. The understanding of the classes. Okay, so, so um, the the data storage is obviously an important uh, topic. We have our own file binary file format that we use in, in root for uh, high energy physics data. It starts uh, with the, the, the root file. The root file is a, is a container uh, format. And uh, in this way, um, similarly, you might be familiar also with HDF5. So you have like a little file system in a file, right? You can put objects inside, you can structure them hierarchically. And that's very convenient to combine, for instance, data with plots that you have like one object in the end that you can ship around. Now, the interesting part now is this object that represents the actual data inside uh, this root file, how does, how is this structured? And um, this is where, where a columnar uh, layout gets, uh, gets important. And uh, on the right side, I have shown like, like I said, typical structure of an event. And you have, you have some Scala properties, and then you, you have some collections inside, like number of particles, and you might have this uh, on, on several nesting levels. So, so in the particle, you might again have a collection of artifacts. Um, this is simplified, right? So in reality, the numbers we're speaking about is something like 10K properties for the, for the entire data structure. Um, and not the one format, but typically research groups write out each their own custom optimized uh, event representations. Um, and of course, a lot of, of data of it. And if you look around what, what exists uh, in industry, it's not that many on the, on the columnar side. There's essentially now Apache Parquet and, and Apache Arrow. Um, that is a sort of a competition for root, if you will. And uh, I think one of the, of, of the very nice unique features of, the, of, of root that we get with Kling is a seamless C++ integration. So unlike, uh, unlike other data formats, you don't, as a user, you don't need to explicitly define your, your schema, your data schema, but your objects, your C++ objects are your data schema. What about graphs in general? Are they even considered? Because they're more, more generalized than what you would have, but there's a lot of work going on in graphs. I think that at the moment, there's not a lot of, uh, we are not looking very, very 
carefully into that. Uh, but this is uh, sounds interesting. So you, you like um, net graph storage systems. Yes. So, so for example, we in, in Leipzig and Scats AI, we have Hadoop as a as a okay. collection for for graph access on Hadoop and something like this. Uh, so this is more versatile in mm -hmm. the sense what you need. Of course, it's this is just a subset of graphs. But I know that a lot of work is going on on graph databases and machine learning on graph databases uh, due to, to due to their excellent handling of sparse data and, and mm -hmm. this is, this might be be something to at least look at i think they're far from the performance you're looking at mm -hmm. But there are new developments coming up in how to handle those objects and so on. And this also covers then collections of objects. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, graphs are a very versatile way of expressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very complex things. There are some ideas of uh, of looking at this from a database angle. Mm -hmm. Again, Alice is doing yeah, yeah. some work in this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, you, I mean, if you are a database person, you 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 know you make a relational model from this, mm -hmm. and uh, this is one way to look at the data. I think uh, what you want at the end is a so this is my uh, opinion. What you what you want at the end as a as a researcher is at least an interface that allows you to access event by event. Mm -hmm. That is something that you not like at least directly have with a relational model. Mm -hmm. But from a statistical point of view, you actually don't need this because this is just that is true. Because yeah. you're actually looking at at a at a statistical variation over many events. So from the from the pure physics point of question, the the single event, though it may be interesting, is is first or or should not play a role. Of course, I know that there are not many events in the first signal compared to the background. And it's nice to see in the event display a single event and see the two gammas coming out or whatever. So I, I understand this from a psychological view, but from a from a data analytics view, the the, the statistics view is the only that should count in the end, probably. I think one of the problems is the is the um, complexity of oh, what you have to do for the corrections, and you know you do. You, you extract the statistical properties event by event. And what you have to do in a single event might be different from what you have to do in the next event. Sure. And so to express this as code is a bit, I don't know, more straightforward if you can look at a single event. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, sorry for no, no, no problem. It's, uh, it's actually very useful. I, I should, I should have something to make notes. I, I all, yeah, I did I say all of this is recorded? Ah, yes. <laughs> uh, right. So, right. So the the other important uh, point to understand is that uh, very often in analysis you don't. You, so you have a certain data set, but you don't look at all of it you look only at a part of it. Let's say only at, I don't know, the energy. I mean, that's in reality not true. But let's say like 10% or 20% of everything you find in there. And that, of course, is a big argument for columnar storage. Because if you, so if you don't put event one, event two, event three on disk, but you put ID one, ID two, ID three, and then, so it's SOA, AOS. Uh, essentially, but on on mass storage, then then you can get the the data in in larger blocks in larger chunks, and the challenge is to make this columnar with nested collections, right? and so this is typically then then how this looks on disk. You you have um, you have the elements uh, packaged in some small blocks. We call them now pages. Uh, typically, you know, a few kilobytes, let's say, you know, 60, 100 kilobytes, something like this. Uh, this is also our unit of compression and decompression. And here, so the, the color coding relates to the struct on the right side. Uh, so here in blue, for instance, you have uh, all the first FID members. And so what do you do with the nested collections? Well, you store them in two columns. You have one column that tells you the size of each and every collection. And then uh, you you recurse and you have then the, the pages that represent 
let's say in this case, the energies, right? So this, this uh, red dot here might contain a three, meaning that the first um, event has three particles inside. And then when well, you look at the first three elements here to get the first uh, uh, three energy entries. Uh, so that is so, so that is how you can, can store the data in a columnar format. And an important additional step is to do a clustering here. So you you have to you have to still find units that encapsulate the data of a certain event range. This is then what the cluster is. Um, so inside this, so it's like AOSOA. This is what you want to have at the end on, on the storage level. And the, the good cluster size for storage is I don't know, tens of megabytes, right? The Google file system many years ago had these chunks of 64 megabytes, which I don't know, somehow became one of the gut feeling norms that you, that you use today. It's also a unit of parallelization. So this is where it becomes very use, useful, the fact that you know certain event ranges in this cluster, because you can say, I, I take this 100 megabyte block and send it to this machine over there. And I know this is all the data from events one to 100. Right, so if you looked a bit around what, uh, what other um, uh, systems exist for data storage. Um, of course, performance is an important point, but you also have some other properties that uh, you want to have in your scientific or high energy physics data format. Uh, for instance, things like that, it's self-describing, right? that in the file you actually understand what is the schema of the data that you wrote, uh, the support for nested types, uh, the good compression support, that's actually a very interesting topic. And then what's provided by almost no other uh, system is schema evolution. That is important given the long lifetime of experiments. You start with a class, that is your event, but then after two years, you figure out, ah, you know what? I actually want to add two members and remove this one and switch the names of those two. And then you have a mix of old classes and new classes. You sort of need to match them. And so, so this is the what is called schema evolution. You need to have some support in the I.O. It's good to have some support in the I.O. layer for that, at least at the level of versioning that you say, okay, this was my class version 0, 1, 2, and then you can write some conversion code between them. Yeah, we looked at uh, performance things. This is already a little bit uh, ancient. <laughs> These are some 2017 measurements. We're actually about to update them this year. Uh, what we can see in this plot is that the columnar format actually works. So on the left side, we read just two out of, I don't know, 25 in this case variables. On the right side, we read all of them. Uh, and we can see, well, uh, this, this columnar property actually worked. And uh, on the right side, oh, you know, if you have row-wise, uh, if you anyway read all of them, then there are some that, uh, you know, row-wise formats that are faster. But we can also, you know, explain this. I mean, we really see that uh, in the columnar case, we, we read only those little bits and pieces of the file. Um, what you see actually with HDF5 is interesting. This is if you have no clustering, right? Yeah, of course, you can store things in a columnar layout also in HDF5. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do it with clustering, uh, I mean, at the end, you still want to combine uh, like several features. And that means, okay, now you have to read this chunk and that chunk and that chunk on the very right end, uh, which is, you know, far away and you seek around quite a bit. So this is, uh, was an interesting um, discovery, if you will. Um, Parquet is interesting because it's columnar. You should see the, the checkerboard pattern. And uh, it turned out we, we found an issue here that was meanwhile addressed and fixed. One of the reasons why it's high time to, to redo these benchmarks. And uh, well, but in principle, you could say, well, fine, you know, we, uh, it's columnar, it's fast, you know, the problem is solved. Um, anyway, we started an R&D on, on improving this root uh, file format, which uh, is now called root RN tuple. And the reason for this is actually twofold. One is the higher rate of data we expect from the HLLHC. So we, we expect ballpark 10 times, let's say, the, the number of events. And uh, we don't find 
just like this, 10 times the number of resources in computing, not even if you factor in the, the technological uh, progress. So software needs to get better. But also the storage hardware changed a lot. So the, the original root IO was designed in the 90s when the gap between compute and storage was very big. Right? You usually what you try to minimize is number of system calls, number of read calls, but everything in between, like the read call is so expensive that you can do whatever in between. It doesn't matter. And that's not the case anymore. Right? If you look at modern storage devices, you have something like 10 gigabytes per second from um, even more from your network card um, or you know, from your flash device. Uh, so that means you have really only a few cycles anymore uh, between your storage accesses. So all these ideas of CPU optimization, they suddenly need to become part of your I.O. code as well. And, and now you need to have a lot of PhD students exchanging their SSD cards all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's fantastic the progress to see in in, uh, in flash storage. Yeah, yeah, but they're still limited in terms of how many, how often you can access. Yes, their, their lifetime. Is... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that mostly concerns write cycles, isn't it? Yeah. If you read mostly, then they don't break so fast. Well, that's true. Cool. <laughs> And also on the systems layer, we see changes. Uh, we see changes away from the POSIX file systems to object stores. And uh, this has happened in the cloud, but it's even happening on HPCs. Um, at least this is what, yeah. what I have seen here and there. I mean, you have probably more experience with this, if this is a general trend or, or if it will stay in the end with Luster. <laughs> Nobody likes Luster. Okay, <laughs> all right. Right, so but the, so there's a, there's there at least some movements to move away from this uh, constraint of the POSIX file system. So that was, that was the motivation to start a new uh, new R and D to start you know, with the experience from the root IO, but uh, start the code from scratch. And the first thing we wanted to see is okay, if you know, can we actually be faster? Yes, uh, there's actually quite a lot to gain. I mean, this in blue, the root IO was, was optimized for uh, many years, but still, I mean, if we apply one of you know, a few of those ideas, uh, like uh, moving, you know, making the making the code more IO friendly and you know, making it more friendly to, to um, SSDs and you know, fast storage devices, yes, uh, you know, things can be faster. Uh, what's also interesting here is the interplay of uh, your know, compute and storage. So this shows different uh, compression algorithms. And okay, you might think, oh yeah, you know, if I if I read uncompressed, it's very fast because I don't have to spend all the time in in, in decompressing. Yes, but you have to read more from a device. So uh, you know, and if you are on the other end of the spectrum, LZMA, uh, you know, what you have to read from the device is very little, but you spend a whole lot of compute time in uh, in, in decompressing the data. So you have a sweet spot somewhere which you can. Oh, we have a paper on that. You have a paper on that? Oh, I would be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one so, from Axel. Who? That's the Axel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in our case, we found a sweet spot with ZSTD yeah. for for this example. Uh, Right. Then I, I will probably skip a, over this quickly. The, the, the point to take away from this is the logarithmic scale uh, of, the, of the y axis here, the, the throughput axis. Oh, nice. So a good I.O. system has to perform well for very different I.O. characteristics, right? From, from you know, slow network to spinning disk to solid state disk to maybe something like obtain. So there's a very wide range orders of magnitude in difference in latency and throughput of the devices. And then what actually counts or one of the things that counts is the application defined IO scheduling. So the application knows pretty well or has a, has a, can make a pretty good guess what data <laughs> is required next. So it makes sense to put an explicit IO scheduler in the application. And we actually looked at this when we measured um, with Obtain and DDIMS, because then you have a storage device that you can MAP. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, you know, naively, or at least my, my first uh, in, you know, thinking was, oh, that's great, let's MAP, you know, zero copy, you should get the fastest IO from MAP. Well, if you look at the, at the purple bars here, that's not the case, actually. You get the better throughput 
from the explicit read call from the explicit IO scheduler. Because MAP you know, doesn't know what the application is doing. It's, uh, it's doing some heuristics. Uh, I mean, at some point, you have to read from the device, and MAP, well, reads as the requests come in. And with an I.O. scheduler, we can, uh, we can do read ahead. We can do this in parallel and so on. And also, what you could confirm is that you know, end to end uh, performance we actually gain by uh, reading in parallel from an SSD. Uh, this is I mean, not a surprise because the SSD is inherently a parallel device. Um, it's just not uh, on a software engineering side a uh, little bit cumbersome to to, to uh, you know to, to write the parallel I/O code. This measurement has been done simply with threads, but meanwhile a very interesting uh, kernel development got stable, which is the U-ring, so the async. Uh, I also support in the kernel. That's very nice. You can say with this with the viewing system, I take a bunch of requests, like my next 20, 40, 50, 100 requests, send it to the kernel. You know, you schedule the rest and let me know when they are all done. Uh, this is a really a very nice development. This is how it's implemented now. Mm. Why, why do you scale so badly here? I mean, basically, you see a, a, a strong scaling that levels uh, after four streams or something. I mean, difference yes. between four and sixty-four is maybe still there, but not a big effort. You know, you're already at two at four, but you're not re reaching a speed up of three even with sixty-four streams. Does, right. is, is this to the? Is this the SSD? Is this? So the, the 1.2 gigabyte per second, was this was the max out of this particular SSD oh. uh, at the time. We now see four or five gigabyte per second that we can get from, an, from, from a modern SSD. Okay, that's, so that's basically the internal, uh, what you would expect yes. from the SSD. Now the scaling might nevertheless still be not, not great. Oh yeah, sure. Um, and this is actually a good question. I mean, what we measure here is end to end really the full right. analysis, including uh, histograms and oh, so okay. uh, But it would be actually interesting to see where, where are the points that limit the scaling, because it's true, I will also would expect even a bit more to see, to see yeah, the uh, curve. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Question. Uh, you, you, you mentioned just now that uh, you used threads for the benchmarks. Has this been done using multiple threads? This measurement was done with, with multiple threads, yes. Okay, because uh, like the way I would I would think of, 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 of multiple streams is that it's about the, the number of concurrent requests. So the application could still be, let's say, single threaded, but then enqueue like multiple asynchronous read calls. Yes. It's about the, the, the read calls that, exactly. that, that get uh, overlapped. This is one of the very nice things. We have some opportunities to do transparent parallelism in the I.O. layer. This is how it's implemented now. Mm -hmm. uh, you have you can you can have a single threaded program, mm -hmm. uh, but then internally we see okay these are the the features that you need. Mm -hmm. We probably you know we should actually look at the next few clusters, mm -hmm. and then we can schedule those reads in parallel in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So the application level parallelism in terms of threads of compute is completely decoupled from like the the, the read uh, parallelism. Completely at, at least decoupled somehow is, decoupled. But is is somehow decoupled? Yes. Okay. You can yeah. your smart copies. Yeah. Just okay. mentioning that. <laughs> Um, I mean, in terms of coupling, for instance, you can you can uh, run into a situation of overload. Yeah, so you start a few threads for parallelization. Okay, not I/O, but let's say we do the decompression compression in parallel, uh, and the application starts a few threads on their things, uh, and then you overload the system. So you need to find some ways to cooperate. Have like, for instance, a single. Uh, let's say TBB task pool or something, but you need to agree on something. You need to agree on on some moderator that knows okay how many threads can I actually start here. Reason, but isn't this like uh, finally expressing the data dependencies on all those tasks? Yes, um, this is how TBB does it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's it's not. I don't know. It's not particularly difficult. It's just cumbersome because this one part of the program has has its way of expressing dependency, and the other part of the program, you know, root has perhaps its own way, and then you want to combine it with, uh, yeah, it's just that. 
it's, it's, uh, it's oh, we, we can show you so many things. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, so and I want to, to close with the uh, topics that we are currently uh, spend some time thinking about. So what, what are we currently working on? Uh, well, one interesting topic is the, is the compression. Uh, of course, I mean, what you have seen before is like the first simple thing that you can do. You, 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 you pick a standard text Compression, compression engine like ZDIP, ZSTD. But you can actually be a whole lot smarter if you look at your data types, if you, if you understand your data. And uh, even with these standard algorithms, you can be smart. For instance, we have seen that LZ4 uh, is pretty bad when you compress um, like uh, monotonically increasing integers, one, two, three, you know, five, eight. Well, it turns out this is exactly the type of data that you have when you have these nested collections that you typically store like offsets. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is what you, so what you can do is you say, okay, this particular column, I, I compress with a different compression algorithm. And, and for that column, I use another compression algorithm that's optimized for this. But this is something you could do. Then a very nice trick uh, I find is byte splitting. So here, if you have an array of integers, instead of storing integer by integer, you store the first byte of the integer and then all the second bytes of the integer. Or, you know, you do this with floats. You store all the first bytes. And with floats, it's interesting because, uh, you know, the, the significant part usually comes first and is often equal, right? If you, have, if you have a distribution where the floats are all more or less the same. So there you get the better compression ratio by just, just like 90% of scientific software. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. And, then, and, it, and it's directly, uh, of course, of course, related to, to low precision flows. So they're, exactly. they're very similar. Exactly. So for instance, one way to get to low precision flows is that you zero out the least significant bits. And if you then combine it with byte splitting, oh, it turns out you have a whole lot of zeros, which is perfect for compression. There has been some work like uh, already 10 years ago on that for GPUs and mixed mm -hmm. precision computing and making use of this because this also enables you to put more data into the cache of the GPU at the same time. And there has been a lot of work, unfortunately, all these PhD theses then, that then vanish again. Yeah, so we try to uh, make this part of a production system. Yeah, yeah. so you have, you have the ability to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we are working on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, then another uh, um, item I find interesting, a small, you know, research project could be, or a small project could be the, the, the merging, you know, O of one, constant merging of files. Wow. Uh, that is something that we can now do with the RN tuple file format, because we took some care to split metadata and, and data. And nowadays, modern file systems give you this option of, of zero copy clones. And you can say, okay, I have a file here, I have a file there. Now I want to create a new file that has all the same blocks, just it's a single file and not two files. And this is a metadata only operation, right? So you, you just create a new entry that says, ah, oh, you know, I, I reference all these blocks uh, together. And so what you could imagine is with this format that has a strict separation of metadata and data, you, uh, you, you do the clone, you write a new footer, and that's it, you know, end of story. And this would be particularly interesting with a distributed file system. I'm actually not sure if, like CFFS or so supports this or any other luster CPFS. But uh, this could be actually interesting game changer because the, the merging of files and you know copying it around to just to merge, there's a lot of effort going into this. I mean, somehow, you know, it's not useless, but it's not the physics work. It's somehow it looks like something that we shouldn't do. Mm. But still, the physical location stays the same, so you should see something in the end, but not much. Right. I mean, that's also part of the file system's job to, on the long run, take care that uh, that would be interesting. Yeah. Somehow bring, bring logically close things physically close. Okay. 
whatever. Yeah, so object stores, I think, is another interesting uh, activity. You can think about what makes an object. Is it a page? Is it cluster? I think there's some indication that, so I call it now a page group, that you have, uh, you can find some some object in the middle between the page and the cluster. But this is this is very much like heterogeneous computing works right now, where you have a where you have a memory hierarchy that fits to a certain streaming ability of your of your hardware. If you look at the GPU, you have the shared memory, which is very small, but can be accessed by a certain bandwidth. When you have chunks of a certain size, that fits perfectly. Same goes with the with a global memory copying to the CPU, and again you have a certain bandwidth with the with the um, uh, with the network and so on. So again, what you usually do is that you create optimum what we call chunks or tiles. Tiling is is what you would typically call this by now in HPC. That you say depending on the memory hierarchy of the problem, you have certain optimum sizes of the problem that just fit in the unit of what you're doing work with. And this is exactly one of the things uh, that, that I wanted to, to, to share with Bernard this week, that this is a typical and reoccurring scheme in, in heterogeneous computing right now that you basically select those chunks you make them optimum size and optimum layout, and then it's done, but you don't really want to know that this is happening. You really, you're, you're, yeah. On the front side, you don't really care whether it's now separated in these chunks or mm -hmm. these chunks in the end, as there's a homogeneous interface to that, and you just work on part of the data, the part that you have in that system, and then you go to a larger part, and you, you know, but you don't really care. That's, right. that's one of the, 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 the developments I very, see very strong connection. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, the, the, this is why page page group cluster, that's, uh, you, you, I think you can just translate this directly to tiling. Mm -hmm. You see, very similar. Right, yeah, well, the, the object store, I think, is interesting for another reason as well. You, you, you break out of this uh, file well, of this file constraints, uh, which is I mean, the file is a useful thing, but uh, still it, it gives you like a frame around your data that is hard to to escape. But once you are at this concept of of objects, which is you know more I don't know, it's more undefined. You know, your your single object might be just a page or so. You can start and do a whole uh, a whole lot more with mix and match. Yeah. Right, so the, you don't need to generate a new file because you want to have that feature from file A and that fi feature from file B, but you can just take them. They are there as objects. You can you, you reinterpret what you already have exactly and remap what you have exactly. Um, ah, yeah. And the last point is something that comes back to files, um, but uh, this is an interesting one when you start copying around files, and oftentimes those files get slightly different metadata. Uh, you know, some things change, or you change, let's say, the compression algorithm, or you change the, uh, you know, like the, the page sizes or so. But still, it would be nice to know, is this actually the same content than that? Uh, but you cannot do byte level comparison. You have to find some other way of fingerprinting it. Uh, I don't know what, 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 uh, what would be a good way, but I would find this an interesting problem to solve. Um, would like auto encoders be useful for that, or would they be too unreliable? I think you want to be sure in this case. Uh, yes, you you can get an approximate answer uh, probably with this technique, but uh, for data management, you want to be really sure about it. So something like hashes. Yeah, more like cryptographic hashes, right? This is something, or at least checksums. That would have been the first I would go for either, but. Uh, the, the the point you're mentioning is interesting because then I would look also at the statistics and see how often it is the case that I have actually two same files because if the work can be done much faster in understanding that two files are different and these are the most more common cases then only at the point where you have a certain measure that tells you please look in detail. Ah. 
like a bloom filter. Exactly, yeah. that you basically say when, when they are different and I can find this out very fast and I don't have to see whether they are the same. And if I have a certain uncertainty on knowing that they are not the same, uh, then I would go in depth and, and look a bit stronger up yeah. to final byte comparison if I really wanted to do that. But the, the harder the comparison get, the longer the, then it would be interesting because I can't imagine that I have so many of the same files on a system. But this, of course, uh, comes from the application point of view. And yeah, it's and, usually not something you can afford at large scale to have too many copies of the data. Exactly, exactly. So, so I would usually uh, see that, that, or I would assume that most data in different files is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, thank you for listening.